morning, church. Hi, good morning to all of you over there at Suntech. Um, this weekend is the first installment of the Wear White, okay, Half White. And then two weekends later, you know, we really want to support the cause for the family. You know, we're going to wear as much as white as you can, all right? And today, we're going to continue with our series, okay, Eternity Now, as we study into the book of Revelation. Now, as we study the book of Revelation, just a very quick recap that we must remember this book is not just about what's going to happen in the end times, what's going to happen in the future, but exactly what does it reveal about our God, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we preach through the messages to the seven churches, you know, uh, followed by the seven seals and then the seven trumpets and the two witnesses just before last weekend where we took a break because last weekend, weekend is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, I was with uh, Pastor Kong and Pastor Nina and a group of uh, team pastors in Jerusalem. I just want to encourage everybody, you know, the amazing stories we have heard. I tell you, God is moving around the world. In one of the tracks that we attended, it was about signs and wonders and healings. You know, there's this Uganda pastor. He prepared a video testimony and all the stories inside that video were about people who were raised from the dead. They don't even talk about healing because why? There's so many healing. And because the country is so big, sometimes by the time they reached their place, they were supposed to pray for healing, the patient already died. And they have to raise that person from the dead. I tell you, in the end times, there will be times of trouble, there will be times of tribulation, but the Word of God tells us He will pour out His Spirit mightily upon His sons and daughters. So we are seeing that right now, and I want you to be excited because the power of God is going to hit us, the presence of God is going to intensify. So last weekend in our church, we preached about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I watched a video by Pastor Tai Tong right now in Suntec, and I remember that in his opening prayer, he kept praying that, uh, Holy Spirit, we long to see you. Holy Spirit, we long to, uh, to receive your power. He kept mentioning my name, we long, we long, we long. So today, I'm here. <laughs> We're going to look through the book of Revelation chapter 12. And um, I must say that I really appreciate our senior pastor, Pastor Kong, as well as Pastor Daniel Kong, our deputy senior pastor, who have gone before us for the last three months, if you didn't realize, okay, they have been faithfully preaching the difficult passages, okay, about the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the two witnesses. And as I prepared this weekend's message, I realized it is not easy, first of all, to um, understand all the different views, and then you have to simplify the message, understand them, and then today try to communicate to you in less than one hour. Okay, so I personally read up so much for, for this weekend's message and um, it is the first time I realised uh, how much you need to study in order to be able to present all that they have been doing for the past few months, alright? So I, I want all of us to put our hands together and really appreciate them for the labour of love that they have put in. Thank you, Pastor. So right now, I'd like you to turn the Bible to Revelation chapter 12, okay? And let's see what the Lord has for us this weekend. Revelation chapter 12 says this, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. Verse 5. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumph over Him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. 
Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness, where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time, out of the serpent's reach. Verse 15, Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's command and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word because there is power in your word. And Lord, we ask right now that you will illuminate your word and let your anointing come upon this place. That Father, help us to understand and to capture the spirit, the hope that you want to communicate to us. So Father, we ask for a fresh anointing in this place. And Holy Spirit, we want to welcome you. You are our counsellor, our teacher, our friend, our God. So right now, let your presence fill this place and communicate your truth to us. Let no word return to you empty without accomplishing all that it is set out to do. And Father, if there be anybody here who does not know Jesus Christ, I pray that their spiritual eyes be open to see your truth, their hearts be open to receive your love, and their spiritual ears open to hear the voice calling out to them. And Lord, this will be a day of their salvation. We commit this whole service into your hands. We ask for the covering of the blood of Jesus over us and the power of the Holy Spirit to be displayed in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Now this portion of Scripture in Revelation 12 comes after Revelation chapter 11, okay? So very common sense. And the last part of Revelation 11 tells us that it was the sounding of the seventh trumpet and when the seventh trumpet was sounded, the 24 elders fell on their faces and declared that the reign of God has come. Meaning that the judgment of the dead and the reward of God's faithful servant has come. And the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 11, the last part, that the temple in heaven was opened and the ark of the covenant was seen, accompanied by flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and a severe hailstorm. Then we enter into Revelation chapter 12 where John, who wrote this book of Revelation, he saw a great vision. What did he see? It is very clear from what we have just read. What he saw was a description of what happened in the heavenly realms. There was a cosmic conflict, a power struggle, a war that happened in the heavenlies from the description of the images that we have just read. Hence the title of my message this morning. It's war in the heavenlies. I believe this war in the heavenlies will affect you and me on earth as it is referring to a time that is to come in the future where there will be terrible times, a time of trouble that is unparalleled in the history of mankind. Therefore, pay attention to this weekend's message. Sit tight and follow closely because it can be confusing based on the imagery that you have just read. Today, we will try and understand what is happening in this vision in Revelation 12, and we begin by trying to study and understand who the, the main characters are in Revelation 12. Why, what, what do they represent and what do all these mean for us? So let's go through the three characters. There, were, there are three main characters in this vision. Firstly, there is a woman, and then there is a child, a male child, and then there is a big red dragon, okay? And very interestingly, my name in Chinese is Wei Long, okay? Which you understand, it also means a dragon. But this dragon is not me. This dragon is a red dragon that's a terrible creature. Okay, so let's go and study them one by one. The first main character in Revelation 12 is a woman. Revelation 12 verse 1 to 2 says, A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain and she was about to give birth. Now, Bible scholars suggest that this woman could refer to the nation of Israel and while others think that it could refer to the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. I personally, after doing some study, think that the, the stronger case refers to this woman as the nation of Israel. 
Because this is a classical way that the Old Testament presents the whole nation of Israel. Okay, they use a woman to describe uh, uh, the whole nation in the Old Testament. And the additional description of the crown of 12 stars support this. Because why? The 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And in fact, the Genesis, in, 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 a, in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, there is this great man called Joseph. He's the descendant of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. And he had a vision of the sun, the moon, and the stars. And these were always consistent with the description of Israel. When there's a mention of 12 stars, it refers to the 12 tribes. So I believe that this woman who has the 12 stars, who, is a, who has a sun and a moon with her, she represents this nation of Israel. I do not think that the woman is the picture of the church because the church is described as a virgin bride in the Bible. Hence, it is unlikely that this pregnant woman is referring to the church. So now that we said that this woman refers to the nation of Israel, what does the male child represent? Who is this child? Revelation chapter 12 verse 5 says, She gave birth to a son, a male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Now make a guess, who is this male child? Hello? Jesus Christ. It is clear from this that this child is being referred to as the Messiah who came from the Jews. The description of the rulership with an iron scepter is very clear and the snatching up to God and the, to His throne allows us to quickly conclude that this male child is none other than our Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, who was raised from the dead and who ascended to heaven and is seated to the right of our Father in heaven. In fact, the reference to this iron scepter and the nations coming under his reign is supported in Psalm chapter 2, verse 7 to 9. I will declare the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. This day I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possessions. You will break them with a scepter of iron. You will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, these are familiar words, especially the words, you are my son. This day I have begotten you. We saw the video about River Jordan, right? This is exactly what happened when Jesus entered the water in River Jordan to be baptized by John the Baptist. The Bible tells us what? The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove and a voice was heard saying, this is my son. And that tells us that this male child is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. So now that we have concluded the first two main characters, then we can go to the third main character in Revelation 12, who is the dragon. Who is this dragon? Revelation chapter 12, verse 3 says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. The answer is then given in verse 9, very straightforward. Verse 9 says, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and the angels with him. Now this dragon is the ancient serpent who was in the Garden of Eden who deceived Eve, the first woman to disobey the command of God. Now what does the word Satan mean? The word Satan means adversary of man or an enemy. And the word devil actually means an accuser, a slanderer. And the Bible tells us this dragon is the serpent, it is Satan himself, it is what we call the devil. So now we settle all the three main characters, okay? The woman who refers to the nation of Israel, the child who refers to our Lord Jesus Christ, and the dragon who is the devil or Satan himself. And we must make a note here in verse 9, it says what? The devil, Satan, leads the whole world astray. That is his mission today. To lead the whole world into confusion. He did that many years back. He's still doing the same thing today. He will continue to do this until the end of times. Today, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about what the Bible tells us about the devil. The Bible also describes the devil as a murderer, a liar, and somebody who has no truth in him. John chapter 8, verse 44 says this You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So the Bible is very clear that the devil is a murderer. His aim is to kill us. 
If not physically, spiritually. He is a father of all lies. There is no truth in him. And the Bible even tells us the devil is capable of disguise. He can disguise himself as an angel of light so that mankind cannot recognize him. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 says, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Why is it so scary that the, the devil can masquerade, can disguise himself as an angel of light? It is because if he can pretend to be something that appears to be good, people will worship him. He looks like an okay God, a good God. But when you do that, we are deceived into following a counterfeit God who is Satan himself. We will not look for the one and only true God. Many people think that Satan is an ugly creature with horns and when you look at the devil, you know that, oh, this must be the devil. I tell you, if that is the truth, nobody will ever worship Satan. Why? Because the moment you see Satan, the devil, and because he's so scary, would you go and worship him? No. But he masquerades himself, he disguises himself as an angel of light so that we who are deceived will follow Him, will obey Him and not seek after the true God. He is a father of all lies. He is the most crafty creature that ever was created. He wants to deceive us and to blind us from seeing the truth or the light of the true God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Today, I believe as the truth of God is being presented, many people are going to receive the light of the true glory of God. So the devil is a deceiver. He will use everything to stop us from knowing God. And in fact, many around the world today have already been deceived by the devil because they do not follow our Lord Jesus Christ. They follow every other kind of false god. And some of us may even have believed in the greatest lie. Do you know what's the greatest lie the devil can do to deceive us? It's to tell you that he doesn't even exist. Pierre Baudelaire said this, the devil's most beautiful ruse is to convince us that he does not exist. If you are somebody sitting here, you don't believe that there is such a thing called the devil or Satan or demonic powers, you have already fallen into a lie. Why? Because the Bible speaks clearly that the devil is working and probably with his de demon, demons and evil spirits that are influencing the world that we live in. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 2 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. There is a spirit, there is an evil spirit that is working in those who are disobedient, who don't believe that there is a God or we follow other false gods. He is at work in all these people. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says this, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It is clear by now that human beings have a spiritual struggle that is going on around us against spirits that are evil and dark forces. I'm not trying to scare you. These are the facts that the Bible teaches us. Satan is real and he can work through human beings. Today, I hope that you will believe that the devil is real and that there is a battle that is already going on and it will intensify in the days to come as we approach the last days. How many of you believe that we are living in the last days already? If you look at the sign of the time, it is true. Because why? In Matthew 24, when, when the Bible talks about how when the disciples ask Jesus what will happen in the last day, the Bible tells us that Jesus said there will be rumors of wars, there will be earthquakes, many natural disasters. Yesterday night before I came up to preach at about, uh, at about 8 p.m., I received a message that says there was an earthquake of what? 8.5 that was near Japan. And the thankful thing is that the earthquake was very deep. So there was no tsunami, but it was an 8.5 earthquake. When was the last time that you hear of so many major earthquakes? Do you realize that the last few months we have been having earthquakes of 7.6, 7.8, now it's 8.5. There are so many earthquakes in such a short span of time in Nepal, in so many places. And we just arrested in Singapore a 19-year-old, um, I would call it a teenager, who what? Wanted to assassinate. Who wants to kill our Prime Minister and our President. Wars and rumours of war. 
These are the end times. There is a spiritual struggle that's going on and it's going to intensify in the days to come. And I hope that none of us sitting here today will reject the truth that Satan exists and that his demons exist around us and they're influencing events that's happening. In fact, if you pay attention to social media right now, have you heard of this game called Ask Charlie? Or Charlie Charlie? Okay, never. Okay, you better go and study because a lot of young people, this game came from the United States and what, it have, uh, what, what basically it is, is like our Chinese Tiesian. Okay, basically it is a piece of paper where they draw four quadrants, two yeses and two noes. They put two pencils and they will call on this spirit called Charlie who is apparently a Mexican spirit and the pencil will move by itself. You can ask him any question, he will answer with a yes or no by moving the pencil. And you can go online to YouTube or to Facebook, look for that video, and the pencil will move. But the bad thing is this, many people were also attacked by the evil spirit that moved the pencil. So in case there's anybody here who don't believe that Satan is real or the demonic powers are real, I want to tell you there are many evidence to suggest that he exists. In fact, I hope that at the end of this service, when we have a time of ministry, maybe we can cast out some demons. And then those people who don't believe that the devil exists, you can see for yourself and you can come to a knowledge of the truth. The spiritual powers of darkness are not to be ignored. If the devil would even dare to wage war against God in the heavenlies, you can be sure that he will not leave us alone. So let us not be flippant to think that mere human beings can be spared. So turn to your neighbour and tell your neighbour, the devil is real, but don't be afraid. And don't ask Charlie. <laughs> ask Jesus. <laughs> Amen. So now that we settle the question of who are the key characters in the book of Revelation chapter 12, let's look at other things that are happening in the passage we have just read. Revelation chapter 12 verse 4 shows us that the devil was trying to devour the Messiah Jesus Christ when he was born. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. This was exactly what happened after Jesus was born in the city of Bethlehem. The king that was ruling in those days, King Herod, he killed all the children below the age of two years old because he heard about the prophecy of this Messiah. He was afraid that he's going to be replaced as a king. So he couldn't find Jesus. So he basically took a safer approach to kill all the children below two years old. Matthew chapter 2, verse 16 records this for us. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. So you see the fulfillment. You see that this vision that John saw in Revelation 12 actually did happen. This shows us and tells us that the devil Satan is able to work through human beings to accomplish his evil agenda. He is indeed at work in the hearts of those who are disobedient. But this war that we see described in Revelation chapter 12 is not just talking about what happened 2,000 years ago. It is a picture of an intensifying war and the havoc that is going to come on earth in the future. In the future, it talks about this. There's this um, period of seven years called the time of tribulation. Okay? That we, we, we are, what we are reading right now is in fact talking about what's going to come in this future where it is going to be so bad. And we'll try to explain that today, okay? So this is a concept that is not easy. Okay, it's actually not that difficult. But because of time, it may not be easy to explain it very quickly and clearly in a short period of time. But I'll try my best. And you need to follow um, uh, the, the, you know, what I'm going to say and open up your Bible and read the passages, okay? So let me explain this seven-year tribulation period that will happen in the future. The tribulation is an extreme period of pain where God will finish His discipline of the nation of Israel and finalize His judgment of the unbelieving world. So therefore, let's pay attention. Let's go to the book of Daniel, okay? In the Old Testament, where there were some prophecies given to Daniel the prophet about the end times. Daniel is a prophet that lived in the times of 600 to 500 BC, okay? 500, 600 to 500 years before Jesus Christ was born. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 20 to 24, this is what the Bible says. 
while I, okay, Daniel, eh? Daniel the prophet, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord my God for His holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have, co- I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you begin to pray, a word went out which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Now, that's the part that we want to understand this vision as well. Verse 24 says, 70 sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to to bring in the everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So this passage, especially the last verse in verse 24, tells us of this 70 sevens. Some call it the 70 weeks, which has been decreed for the people that Daniel belonged to. And who, who are the people that Daniel belonged to? It's basically the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. God decreed that there will be this time period of 70 sevens to do what? To finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy place. It means it is going to be the end. This prophecy is about the end. This 70 sevens, this time period, is about what's going to happen in the end times, the end of all things. So what does this 77 mean? 77 means 70 times 7, which is 490. It's actually a time period, and we don't think it's days, because why? Nothing happened in the 490 days. But if you interpret it as 490 years, then something happened. Let's continue and read in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 to 26, and see what other information we can get. Daniel 9, 25 and 26 tells us this. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench and in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. Now what do we read here in verse 25 and 26? We read that the Messiah, the anointed one, will be cut off after the second 62 seven. Okay, 62 sevens, which means what? Do you have your calculator with you? Verse 24 tells us there's a period of end times called 77, 490 years. And here in verse 25 and 26, it says what? There will be seven sevens and 62 seven starting from the rebuilding of Jerusalem. When Daniel the prophet was prophesying this passage in 600 to 500 BC, there was no rebuilding of Jerusalem. Basically, Daniel didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know that there was a rebuilding program coming up later. But the prophecy he he received from the angel was this. Mark this, Daniel. From the time the rebuilding of Jerusalem starts, there will be seven sevens and there will be 62 sevens. So total, how many sevens? Seven plus 62 equals? 69 sevens. 69 sevens, you get the mathematics, is 483 years. 483 years after the start of the rebuilding of Jerusalem, you will see the prophecy being fulfilled. What will happen to the anointed one? The anointed one will be put to death and he will have nothing. Who is the anointed one? It's our Lord Jesus Christ. Scholars have studied and they show that when Daniel wrote this, he didn't know what was going to come. But was there a rebuilding program of Jerusalem? Yes, there was. When did it happen? It happened in the year 445 BC in the time of Ezra. So the prophecy about the end times started from the time in 445 BC. Seven sevens and 62 seven, And the Messiah will be put to death. He will complete his job. If you do the calculations, okay, you find that 
Jesus was crucified between 30 AD to 33 AD. Okay? If you find 445 BC, 445 BC, from time zero, you add 30 or 33, you will get something about 477. And you will say, hey, Pastor, the max doesn't add up. Lah. Okay? Because why? It's only 477. We are looking for a period that is 483 years from the start of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So God made a mistake. I tell you, God didn't make a mistake. Because the year that we are familiar with is a solar year. Correct? Solar years means that one year, there's 365 days. But in the Bible, the Jewish people don't follow the sun. They follow the moon. So each month is, in fact, 30 days. And please do the max yourself. Okay, roughly it's about there, okay? I have uh, did some basic calculations. Remember, every four years, there is a leap year. Very good. So if you do the mathematics, you will find that it is indeed true Many scholars do not dispute this, but theologians do not dispute this, that from the time of the rebuilding in Ezra time in 445 BC to the time where Jesus appeared on earth and He finished His job, indeed, the seven sevens and the 62 sevens were completed. So this account for the 69 seven, and what about the last seven? This last seven is the one that apparently there is a gap between the 69 seven and the 77. So this is the seven-year period that we call the tribulation. That it doesn't follow immediately after Jesus died on the cross. Okay, it is commonly called the time of tribulation. And what happened in this last seven? The seventieth seven. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, continue to explain this last seven. It says, He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering and at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So what does verse 27 tell us about this last seven? In the middle of this last seven, half of seven is how much? 3.5, okay, three and a half. An abomination that causes desolation will be set up and apparently, there's a breaking of some covenant. Uh, because why? The Bible says an end is put to the sacrifice and offering. There seems to be something that's disrupted, that is broken at the midpoint of this last seven. Something significant happened in the middle of this seven year of tribulation. And I think that this is exactly what Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 is telling us. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 says, The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. If you do a simple mathematics, remembering that the Jewish calendar is 30 days per month, 1,260 days is equivalent to how many months? No sound. Okay, I've done the calculation. 1,260 days, if each month is 30 days, it gives you 42 months. 42 months is how many years? Three years is 36 months. 42 months will be three and a half years. So it seems to describe, you must remember that when the Bible talks about days, in, in prof, prophetic terms, sometimes one day is equivalent to one year. Okay, that's how uh, theologians and historians describe and interpret some of these things. Then Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 9 tells us what happened after this 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Now the Bible talks about this woman will be cared for by God. This woman represents the nation of Israel. If you study the history of this nation of Israel, they have been persecuted. There is always people who try to wipe off the Jews, who try to invade them, who try to take them captive. It seems like there is a spirit that is attacking this nation of Israel. This woman that is described in the Bible. But what does the Bible tell us? God preserved them. In fact, there is going to come a time in tribulation where they will be persecuted so badly, but God will watch after them. God will prepare a place for them. And in fact, in this middle of the seventh year, at the three and a half years, there is a breaking out of war in the heavenlies. The devil is thrown down on earth. 
And this three and a half years is exactly the middle of the last seven. We see the proof of this calculation uh, that 1,260 days is three and a half in Revelation chapter 11, verse 2 and 3. I don't know whether you remember Pastor Daniel Kong when he was preaching about the, the, the two witnesses. This is exactly the same period that was mentioned. Revelation 11, verse 2 and 3 says, But exclude the outer courts, do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months and I will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So I didn't make up the mathematics. The Bible tells us this 1,260 days is 42 months, exactly the middle of seven. So the last seven in the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 that talks about what's going to come to f- before the end, the 77 is fulfilled is that something terrible is going to happen in the middle of this seven. And if you remember Revelation chapter 11, after the two witnesses have prophesied for 1,260 days, a beast came out from the abyss and this actually coincided okay, with the fact that the dragon was hurled down from heaven in Revelation 12. I don't know whether this amazes you, uh, but if you study by prophecy, uh, let, let's take an analogy. Who can write prophecy? The only person who can write prophecy is the person who knows what's going to happen in the future. So for example, how many of us have aircon at home? Okay? If you know how to use an aircon, if I were to ask you to write a manual on how to operate an aircon, if you can, can you write a basic manual on how to operate an aircon? I'm sure you can. Press the on-off button, adjust the temperature, adjust the fan speed, up or down, whatever. But if the aircon were to break down, would you be able to fix the aircon? Unless you're an engineer by training, you can't. Who is the one person that can write a very comprehensive manual on how to operate this aircon and predict what are the possible problems that could happen to the aircon? It is the designer of the aircon itself. Who is the person that can tell you what is going to happen in the end times? Only God who created the heavens and the earth, who saw the end from the beginning. That's why he could tell Daniel what is to come. That's why he could tell Daniel that from the time of the rebuilding of Jerusalem to the time when the Messiah was crucified, there will be this period of time. This is the purpose of prophecy. So that when it happens, we know that the one who prophesied is true. The one who prophesied is accurate. And in fact, I want to tell you this morning, that God is telling us that the devil will be cast down on earth in the future to come to do havoc and cause massive desolation on earth. Peace will be broken. The war in the heavenlies will translate to extreme pain and turmoil on earth for all mankind who were alive during the period of tribulation. If you study Matthew chapter 24, it describes this period of tribulation as a time that is dreadful. There will be great distress unequaled since the beginning of the world and never to be equal again. So don't think that your tribulation is right now and say, oh, pastor, you don't know my life. You know, my husband or my wife is my tribulation. No. This is not tribulation because why? You have not come to a point where you don't wish to be alive because the Bible says that if those days were not cut short, no one would survive. We have not come to that time yet. There will be massive uh, deception. There will be many false prophets that will come. Deception will be rampant. There will be many false signs and wonders. So this final seven-year period is called tribulation, which is to come in the future. In fact, in the second half of this seven-year, this midpoint of the tribulation, it is a period that people add one more word. It's called a great tribulation because it's going to be worse than the first three and a half years because the devil and his angels are furious. They, are, they know that their time is short. They want to do the maximum damage. But I want to tell you this morning, the encouragement that God has for us is that in the midst of this war where the devil is real, do you know something? If the devil is real, our God is also real. And God is not just real, He is even more powerful. He will come and wipe out all our enemies. The same way He preserved Israel in this time of tribulation, He will preserve us. There will be a great victory for the people of God. He will protect His people. I want to give you two reasons why we need not fear this war in the heavenlies or the tribulation that is to come. Two reasons why as we go through, as we anticipate and wait for this turmoil in the end times, this last seven that will unfold before us, we need not fear this war that's going on because number one, God's protection is absolute. 
you can be sure that the Lord's protection will be upon us. That as you go through the period of tribulation, do not be afraid. Because why? You will see how God's going to protect us. He will hide and protect Israel, this whole nation of Israel, in the coming tribulation, in a time of extreme devastation. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 says, The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. The Bible tells us God prepared a place for her. And all believers who are, who are, who are grafted into this nation of Israel, okay, by, by what Jesus has done for us, we Gentile believers are also received the blessings that came through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we are part of this spiritual Israel. That the Lord says that He will prepare this place for us, that we will be taken care of during the three and a half years. During the times of trial and judgment, God provides absolute protection. Verse 14 of Revelation 12 continues to say, The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness, where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time, out of the serpent's reach. The Chinese version is actually very clear. Chinese version says, 一载, 二载, Okay, that means one, two, and half. You add them all together, how much is it? Three and a half. So can you see the importance of this middle of the tribulation? God is telling us that He will take care of us. There's absolute protection in the midst of a terrible time that is to come. He will protect us. We need not be afraid. We need not be afraid of this war in the heavenlies because the same way God preserved the nation of Israel throughout their history, in this time to come, He will do the same. Verse 16 continues to prove this. Verse 16 says, But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon has spilled out of his mouth. The devil was trying to pursue this nation, this woman, by doing what? Opening his mouth and spill a river, trying to, trying to kill the nation by saliva. And God's supernatural intervention is what? the ground will open up and swallow the saliva so that we do not need to swallow the saliva of the devil. God provides absolute protection. Today, some of us, you need to hear this. Because why? You may think that you're going through a very hard time right now. I want to encourage you, I can encourage you today that if God tells us that in the extreme time that is to come, in the time of tribulation, He can protect us, whatever you're going through today, God is telling you the same thing. If He can protect Israel, in a time of extreme tri tribulation, today, He can protect you as you go through the storms of your life. So today, even as you go through, it's not a real time of tribulation where you do not wish to be alive. God says, I offer you absolute protection. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 tells us, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. God doesn't just protect our physical body. Yes, in this end time, some believers will die. You read about the, the people who were killed, the Christians who were killed by the ISIS. Maybe it is indeed true that these people who follow the ISIS, they are the sons of disobedience that the devil is working through them. I think that is likely so. And Christians will die. But don't be afraid of those who can only destroy the body. But there is a God who protects us. Our soul, our spirit will be preserved for eternity. We will not suffer eternal destruction. God will protect what is eternal. I want to submit to you this morning, what is frightening to us is not disease, nor physical death, but spiritual death. Because spiritual death leads to eternal separation from God and not knowing who God really is. But the encouragement that God gives us is that He offers absolute protection. No matter what the devil throws at us, the dragon may pursue us. Today's circumstances may pursue you. But God offers absolute protection because our God, He is able. You need not live in fear. So this is the first reason why we need not fear this war in the heavenlies because God's protection is absolute. The second reason why we need not fear this war in the heavenlies is because God's victory is assured. We know what will happen at the end. Who wins? You're not confident, is it? Who wins at the end? And if you stand on God's side, will you win too? Yes. 
So God's victory is assured because why Revelation chapter 12 verse 8 tells us, but the devil, he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. No matter how strong the devil is, he is never strong enough for our God. He and his angels will never beat God. In fact, they didn't even get a chance to fight with God. Who did they fight? They fought Michael and Michael's angel. They didn't even meet the king of kings and the lord of lords. So victory is assured. They couldn't even get into the presence of God to face God face to face and actually punch and punch God. Because Michael and his angels already defeated the devil and his angels. This is the absolute, the victory, the assurance that we have that God will defeat the enemies of our soul. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been held down. God's victory is assured. The devil will be thrown down. God's kingdom, His power, His authority will be, will be enthroned in our midst. The devil is a defeated enemy. The victory of God is assured. Verse 12 continues to say, Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. Even the devil himself knows he has already lost. The problem is that Christians are continually deceived. We are the victorious side and we think that we are the losers. But God wants to tell you this morning, do not be deceived by the father of all lies. Do not be deceived by this deceiver. Do not be deceived by your enemy of your soul. Because he knows his time is short. He's trying to cause maximum damage. His time is near. He's after you. He's after all of us. He wants to destroy as many of us as possible. But victory is found in God. I'll ask you a question. If today, the stock price of a of a company called XYZ Company is $10. And if you know that Monday when the stock market opens, it's going to jump to $100. You are very sure it's going to happen because you have some news that is very reliable. What will you do? Okay, it closed at $10. XYZ Company closed at $10 on Friday. Monday is going to open and you have very certain news that is going to jump to $100 per share. What will you do? Monday morning, quickly buy. Buy what? Buy how much? Buy what? Buy how much? Buy as much as you can, as long as your news is reliable. If you don't buy, you are? Yesterday night, the people were smarter. Somebody at the front row said, stupid. <laughs> if you already know what's going to happen at the end, you will be stupid if you don't follow what is reliable, is good. Christians, I want to ask you this question. If you already know that the victory of God is assured, what is stopping you from putting all of your heart into God's kingdom? The only reason is because if you are deceived into thinking that God is not victorious, therefore you hold back. The news is unreliable. Don't buy that much. Lah. But if you know for a fact, if you are sure that God's victory is assured, that's the reason why you can don't love your life. You can overcome the devil because you put your life, you put your whole life into the kingdom of God. We do not know when is the tribulation. When exactly is this seven-year period going to come? But we know that it is near us. But we know who is the winning team and we need to choose this winning side. There is no quick victory in this long war and there is no cheap price for victory. Some people think that, oh, once you become a Christian, everything will be fine. No. In fact, now you become a target of the, of the devil because he wants to destroy you. He wants to pick you from the winning side to the losing side. So if you are a Christian today, don't jump. Don't switch side halfway and say, wow, be a Christian. Have you heard of this lie before? Be a Christian, very tough, you know. Last time when I was not a Christian, I got an easier life. I can smoke, I can drink, I can get drunk, I can do anything I like. Hello, if you talk like that as a Christian, you have already been deceived. Imagine this, the winning side. If you look at a boxing ring, the winner is so-and-so. And while -so. And he was all bruised up, but he wins. He defeated the enemy. If the winner looks like that, 
what is the loser? Do, how do you think the loser look like? The loser should be in ICU. So why do you think, why Christians think that, hey, you know, being a Christian is so tough? That is a lie from the evil one. It is harder to be a non-Christian. You know why? Because you don't have God on your side. You have the devil on your side. Therefore, never believe in the lie of the devil to say that, oh, being a Christian is so tough. Being a non-Christian is tougher. Being a Christian is the easy part because why? I'm on the winning team. I'm a football player, okay, soccer. Last time I was a team captain in my secondary school. Not secondary school, JC. I always think of um, the end time as the 90th minute. You know, soccer game is 90 minutes, right? And when you're on the 90th minute, if you're leading by a lot of goals, uh, what do you do? Don't worry, lah. anyhow pass and play. Because what will happen? In a few seconds time, the referee is going to blow the whistle and if you are 200 goals up, 200 nil, you are leading 200 nil. And it's the last few seconds to go in the game. Why are you worried? If you are on the winning side, if you are, your score is 200 and your opponent is nil, why are you worried? Christians, I want to tell you today, that you need not fear. Whatever you are going through in your life today, God's victory is assured. You are on the winning side. God assures us of His protection and His victory. The devil may pursue you. There may be pain, but the pain will be turned into relief. Your death will be turned to eternal life. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 tells us this. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, eh, will not overcome it. How many more words of the Bible do you need before you really, 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 really believe that the devil is a defeated enemy? That the gates of hell shall not prevail against you? You Christian, if you are, if you are part of the church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. God's victory is assured. We are on the winning team. We are on the winning side. And for some of us, our tribulation, some of us may really come earlier. Your tribulation is, for example, a heart attack. Some of you know my father. If you follow me on Facebook, about two and a half weeks ago, my father had a heart attack. That was his tribulation. But what happened? I want to share with you this story. Because in our life, we are going to have many, many tribulations. I think, can I get the key bodies to come out? Two and a half weeks ago, um, one day, you know, on Thursday, my, before I left for Israel, you know, my dad had a heart attack. Um, actually, we saw the grace of God uh, in, in this whole episode because he was supposed to go overseas. My dad is a professional golfer, okay? Uh, he teaches golf. Don't ask me why I don't play golf that well, uh, you know? Uh, I, I studied, I studied hard, okay? Uh, I didn't have time to play golf, but my dad is a professional golfer, so he, he's quite old, so he joins the senior tour, okay, for people above 50 years old. So the competition actually, the golf competition that they have is actually very little. There's very little opportunities. Um, but it happened that there was a competition in Batam, okay, during that week. But for whatever strange reason, usually he always participates, but this time around he decided not to go. And he had no reason why he shouldn't participate. He just decided maybe he shouldn't go. So he stayed in Singapore, during that week of the competition. And usually when he's in Singapore, he has some of his uh, students that he coaches who will always play golf with him and they will always go to Malaysia and play. Why? Cheaper. But on that Thursday, he decided not to go to Malaysia to play because his favourite student was not free. So he played with another group of, um, of his um, student who decided to play in Singapore instead. So, actually, the night before, on Wednesday night, he was already feeling uncomfortable. But he thought that, oh, maybe it was the durians that I bought. Lah. In that period, I also bought some durians. So, he ate some and he thought maybe it's the heatiness of the durian. So, that night, he had something, he felt something, but he brushed it off. So, on Thursday morning, he went to play golf. And while, after they finished the game, they were having lunch. And suddenly, he felt this tightness in his chest. So, he was breaking into cold sweat. And he told the student, I want, I, please send me home. You know, I think I'm not feeling well. I want to see a doctor. So, he didn't finish the lunch. Student sent him home. He went home, took a shower. Took a shower at home and told my wife. My wife has already quit. Uh, she quit her job already. Uh, she's now enjoying life as a Thai Thai. Why work hard for Jesus? 
Um, that was a Good Friday. Since Good Friday, she, she quit and she stayed at home. And thank God that she was at home because uh, she called the ambulance and then she gave information. She accompanied my father on the ambulance trip to Tan Tok Seng Hospital. So he was rushed to the hospital. I rushed from Chai Chi and I arrived about the same time at the hospital. So um, I went into the A&D department. I didn't even see him because they, they, they immediately wheeled him into the emergency section of the A&E. There's another section inside the A&E that's even more urgent. So they brought him in. I was outside. Actually, when I had my cancer scare, I didn't cry. Uh. But when I saw my father, I went through that, I cried. Because why? My father did not know Jesus Christ at that time. I was concerned for his eternity. Of course, I didn't want him to go, but I was worried that he might really pass away. So the amazing thing was that, you know, the doctors uh, quickly tried to... One of his uh, arteries was blocked. Uh, there are three main arteries, so one of it was blocked very badly. But I want to thank God because they managed to put a stent through, through, through the blood vessel and he didn't have to do a heart bypass. So that was Thursday, somewhere in the afternoon, you know. And thank God, you know why? Because he looked normal. As he went through the heart attack, he's not like the typical heart attack patient that lie on bed, you know, was, uh, had a lot of tubes and were very pale and very weak. He looked very normal. In fact, he was talking to the doctor as they were doing the operation. And although I said to him that day, hey, I think God spared your life, you know, uh, he brushed it off. He said, no lah, you know, no big deal because he had an anesthetic, anesthetic in his body. So he didn't feel any pain when he reached the hospital. So that night, he was put in ICU. He's a very different ICU patient because he was reading newspaper, he was eating well. Uh, while the rest of the ICU patient had lots of tubes, you know, people all concerned. So he, uh, my father was actually reading newspaper inside there. And that evening, I had a meeting with uh, two of my leaders and then Pastor Kong said that he wanted to visit my father at 9.30pm. So I want to thank Pastor for making that visit. Little did we know at actually 8 p.m., before we arrived to visit my father that evening, after my dinner with my leaders, with, together with our senior pastors, at 8 p.m., actually, my father suddenly felt pain in his heart again. And actually, that was a time that he actually felt worried that, wow, maybe he's really going to be gone. So I remember, pastor came and prayed for him and shared with him and tell him this. You know, Mr. Po, sometimes, uh, in Chinese, lah, huh? God has to send us a message that something is wrong with our life that something is wrong with our body, we need to do something. And I felt that that was the word from the Lord. So after pastor prayed for him and pastor left, I continued to talk to my father. I brought him through the journey of telling him that, hey, you should have passed away. If you had been in Batam, you'll be gone. If you had been in JB, you'll be gone. But for whatever reason, you stay in Singapore. And my wife was at home, the daughter-in-law was at home, brought him and I said, would you want to receive Jesus Christ or not? I remember the afternoon when I checked him to ICU, uh, uh, the, the nurse came and asked, okay, we need some particulars. Huh? And uh, when it came to his name, everything I feel up. When it came to his religion, you know, I asked my father, hey, uh, the nurse, uh, Filipino nurse, asked what is your religion. I had to interpret because my dad doesn't speak much English. And I said, I put Christianity. Huh? In the afternoon, he said, um, he thought for a long, long while. He said, no, uh, put, don't put anything. Uh. Okay, he said, that, oh, I stopped worshipping all the idols. I'm no longer a Buddhist. I'm no longer a Taoist. Then he laughed. He smiled at me and said, put nothing lah. Oh, I tell you, at that time I said, because for the last 22 years when I was a Christian, I've been sharing Christ with him. He saw, he saw so many miracles through my life, through my son's life, the one that has a cyst in his neck and was healed. He saw so many miracles, but he refused to accept Christ. Until that same evening, 8pm, when he suddenly felt the pain. When Pastor Kong came to visit, and when we continued to share with him that night, when I asked him again at, after 10 plus, he opened up his heart to receive Jesus Christ. The very... <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometimes your tribulation will come earlier. That's because God is after your heart. God wants to rescue you before you enter into eternity without Him because He wants to give you His victory. He wants to protect you from the harm that's going to come our way. So the very next day, my father told my mother, say, I already prayed to receive Christ. You should do likewise soon. Don't wait. <laughs> After that, last weekend, I went to Israel. Today, I believe the Chinese service is going to come and walk forward to give his life to Jesus. And I 
my brother is here, you know, my elder brother is here. So nobody's going to bring him to church. I hope he knows how to make his way down and to give his life to Jesus. I want to tell you this story because why? I want to tell you our God is victorious God. In 1997, before I know nuts about the Holy Spirit, I was in the Anglican church, I didn't know much about the Holy Spirit. I went to Philippines for a mission trip. There was somebody there that I've never met before. He doesn't know anything about my life. That one first night when I met him, he sat down with me, opposite me, and he said, Brother, I saw a vision. I saw a vision of four persons. One is you, you have a brother and your parents. You are the first Christian in your family. The Lord says, one by one, your family will come to know Jesus Christ. And I said, wow, who is this guy? Ah? I said, I was in a foreign land where nobody knew me. He doesn't know anything about me. And I've never heard something like that, that God is so real. And I begin to learn more. I said, wow, what, what do you mean by you see a vision? He said, oh, I saw a picture, you know, that's in my mind. It's a vision. And he taught me more things about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That same month when I came back, my brother gave his life to Jesus. Nothing happened for the next 22 years until this year. And the Lord is faithful because why? God is in control. He has the victory. Today, no matter what you're going through in your life, I want to tell you, you can overcome because we are on a winning team. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says, they triumph over Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. If God offers us absolute protection, if victory is assured, it gives us reason not to be afraid of dying. And when you are not afraid of dying, the devil cannot do anything to you anymore. Because the worst thing the devil could do is to take away your life. Take away the body life that you have. And if you are not afraid of that, what else can the devil do? He cannot destroy your soul. You will be victorious. So today, Christians, I want to encourage you. You can surrender your life fully to the Lord. Then you can find the overcoming life because we already have the blood of the Lamb. Now it's the word of your testimony. If you do not love life so much as you stream from death, you will overcome the devil in your life. One of the devil's most common tactics is to wear us down, to discourage you, to make you tired and feel that, wow, all my struggles are in vain. Because why? He's the father of all lies. If there's any issue in your life today that you cannot overcome, I want to tell you, you have been deceived. You have been deceived because why? The Bible says that he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. There cannot be a stronghold that God cannot break free in your life. There cannot be a bad habit you cannot be set free from. There is no such thing as you cannot control yourself because the Bible says if you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desires of your flesh. This is the overcoming life that God has for every believer. Tonight, before we close, the, today, this morning, as we, before we close the service, Christians, if you have a stronghold, a bondage, you have a fear, maybe your fear is this one seven two eight go. It discourages you. Instead of being more like a conqueror, you are more than a failure. You feel that way. God wants to set you free from the fear. God wants to set you free from the discouragement. God wants to set you free from everything that wears us down. I tell you, in this Empower 21 conference, there was this Uganda pastor. His church is involved in major church planting movement. You know, you're worried about this one seven two eight go, right? Finding 12 in one year. You know what they do in this church in Uganda? The people are sent out to plant 12 churches in two years. Listen carefully, yeah? it's not to plant 12 persons in two years. Yeah? It's plant 12 churches in two years. And yet, they are not afraid. They go out there expecting God to heal the sick, expecting God to raise the dead, expecting signs and wonders to happen. Why? Because I believe they understood the victory that we have in Christ. So Christians, I want us to respond this morning. But before we do that, I know that there are many people here who do not know Jesus Christ. And before we close this service, I need to give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus, to enter into the arms of this God who loves us so much, who can protect us through every tribulation of our life who has the final victory. And if you're ready to do that, let's all close our eyes and bow our heads all over this place, as well as those over there in Suntec City. Nobody looking around. Let the presence of God come and convict us and touch us. 
In a few moments time, I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer. This prayer is specially designed for people who want to receive, receive Jesus Christ into your heart as your personal Lord and Saviour. And how do you do that? I will pray one line. You will pray that one line together with me. Verbalize it. Say it out loud. Mean it in your heart. Line by line, word for word. And as you do that, Jesus will come into your heart and be your Lord and your Saviour. And the Christians will join along to pray together with you so that you do not feel shy. So if you are ready to do that, you want to invite this God, Jesus, into your heart to be your personal Lord and Saviour, pray this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. And I cannot save myself. I cannot cannot save myself. myself. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you rose from the dead. I believe that you will come again. I believe that you will come again. Today I want to invite you. Today I want to invite you to come into my heart. To come into my heart. Be my personal Lord. Be my personal Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. I surrender my life to you. I surrender my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a child of God. Make me a child of God. I pray this in your most precious name. As all head remain bowed, all eye close, I sense the presence of God here. I believe that there are people who genuinely prayed this prayer with me to invite Jesus into your heart. I want to pray a prayer of blessing for you. And in order for me to do that, I need to know who you are. So I'm going to count to three. And as I count to three, if you follow me for the very first time to pray this prayer, to ask Jesus into your heart, I want you to put up your hand so that I can... I know who you are and I can pray for you. Whether you're over here in Marine Parade, over there in Suntec. As I count to three, put up your hand if you have prayed this prayer with me. I'm going to count right now. One, two, three. Lift up your hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God sees those hands. Are there more? Are there more? If you follow me in a word of prayer or even if you did not follow me in a word of prayer but you want to give your life to Jesus, put up your hand right now because I want to pray a prayer of blessing for you. God sees those hands. Hallelujah. Father in heaven, I thank you for these hands that are raised. God, you know who they are. And Lord, you have heard the cries of their heart. Indeed, God, their sins are forgiven. Today, Lord, we declare that the old have passed, the new have come. Today, they are your sons and daughters. So Holy Spirit, come upon them, clothe them with your love, with your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Can we all stand to our feet and let's give God a clap offering that is worthy of His name. Hallelujah. Come on, people of God. And there's one more thing we're going to do. Just now, there were many hands that were raised. I want the whole church to pray for you, okay? This is the first time you have given your life to Jesus. Just now, you put up your hand. Or maybe you didn't even put up your hand, but you prayed with me in your heart to receive Jesus Christ. As I count to three, I want you to take all your belongings, come to the front, okay? Whether you're at Suntec or over here in Marine Parade, Bring all your belongings and come forward. The friends who have brought you here will come together with you. Or maybe you give your life to Jesus during the project conquest or during your cell meeting, but you have never made a declaration of a faith publicly. I want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning. Okay? So as I count to three, just take all your belongings and come forward. One, two, and three. Church, let's welcome them. Hallelujah. Even if you are seated right there at the top, just come down. Hallelujah. Just leave your seat and come down. Don't be shy. This is a family of God. We'll wait for you. Just now, if you put up your hand, just come forward. If you want to give your life to Jesus, just come. Amen. Amen. I want to tell you, for those of you who are gathered at the front to give your life to Jesus, This is the greatest decision you have ever made in your life. Because this prayer is heard by the God who created the universe. He's going to come into your heart. Come on, let's clap for them. There are still people coming. (laughs) Hallelujah. I want the whole church to pray a prayer of blessing for you. And after this, you follow our pastor and our, our leaders to a room outside where they give you some materials and continue to help you know more about this God. I already sense the presence of God here. 
Okay, so church, let's stretch forth our hands to pray for them. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you. Lord, your love is here. And God, today we know that God, you have touched your children. And Lord, as they take a step of faith to believe in you, Father, we know, we know that you have heard them. And Father, indeed, Lord, their names are written in the book of life. All their sins have been forgiven, washed away by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, they are a new creation in Christ. So Father, we bless them in their body, soul and spirit. You prosper them, you protect them, you heal them. And Lord, you set them free. And Lord, you will walk with them all the days of their life. We commit them into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Can you all follow our pastor room, to a room outside? Same for those of you who are at Suntec. Hallelujah. Come on, people of God. Let's clap for them. When there's one sinner that repents, the whole heaven rejoices. Hallelujah. Today, as we enter into the time of ministry, I felt that the Lord's word for us is that if there are people who are fearful, if there are people who are discouraged, if there are people who are bogged down, if there are people who are depressed, people who feel that you are, your life is worthless, the devil has been telling you lies after lies after lies. He's the father of all lies. But as much as the devil speaks fear, God speaks faith into us. And this morning, you need to receive faith from the Lord. You need to be set free from all the fears. You need to be set free from the demonic powers that keep attacking you. If that's who you are, don't be shy. Just come to the Father because why? He offers us absolute protection. He assures us of His victory. So as we worship the Lord, just come forward and respond to the Lord. Hallelujah. I just sense the powerful presence of God here at the front. I believe the same is happening in Suntec. So if you are right here at the front receiving ministry, just open up your hearts and cry out to the Holy Spirit to pour out His power over you, to set you free from any discouragement, set you free from any deception, set you free from every fear in your life, every defeat of your life, every voices of the devil that speaks to you. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we break that lie. We declare... Whom, he whom the sun sets free is free indeed. All your debts are paid in full by the blood of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that, Father, you are real and you are able, you are powerful. Father, you protect us from absolute harm. Lord, you give us assurance of your victory. And Father, this morning, in the name of Jesus, I declare over your children that we will triumph over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And Lord, there will be this generation that will not love their life so much as to shrink from death in FCBC. I bless your children this morning that they will walk in victory. They will see signs and wonders. They will see the outpouring of the Spirit of God upon their lives. And Lord, we will conquer because Father, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. The gates of hell shall not prevail against us. So I bless them as they leave this place. Lord, your presence go with them. Your victory will be upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. The Lord bless you. Those of you who are still receiving ministry at the front, you can just remain here and be prayed for while the rest of us just quietly leave the building. Thank you. The Lord bless you.